like I said, y'all pray for me today that we can get through the, the service. And uh, when you're a preacher, you have to use your voice. And so if your voice don't hold out, then you're not much good. Uh, but we'll do the best I can today. And I uh, hope that the message will be a blessing to you this morning as the Lord gave me this message this week as I was thinking about this being our recognition day for our seniors. If you would turn in your Bible to the book of Romans. The book of Romans chapter number 13. Romans chapter 13. I'm only going to read one verse today out of Romans chapter number 13. Uh, but it's an important verse in the Bible. And uh, so if you'll find your place there, all the verses of the Bible, I should say, are important. But uh, this one with the message today is especially important. And I do want to encourage you to stay for our fellowship afterward and then also come back uh, tonight at 530 for our uh, presentation on the history of the Bible. Every Christian should know where your Bible came from and what it costs to get your Bible. I'm not talking about the monetary cost down at the Christian bookstore or nowadays everybody buys them online, but the uh, actual cost of life, uh, the sacrifices that were made, uh, imagine a world where you just couldn't go have a Bible, couldn't go get one anytime you wanted. Uh, that was a world that existed for uh, about 14, 1500 years or so since the birth of the New Testament church. And uh, many gave their life just so that you could have the Bible in your own language. I'm not speaking about that today. I'm going to let the video do that at 530. Uh, but even the churches that had Bibles had them in a language the common people couldn't understand. For example, if the Bible was in Latin, uh, you couldn't understand the Bible if, unless you spoke Latin. And so the church leaders would use Latin as a way of controlling the congregations. It brought fear to the people because I know something you don't know is how they approached it. And so they were able to control congregations and, uh, for hundreds and hundreds of years until some brave believers who believed the Word of God just like you and I believe it, that God's Word is available to all people. doesn't matter whether you're educated or uneducated. doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. Uh, doesn't matter if you're a church leader or, or just a lay person in the church. You have access to the Scripture, equal access to the Scripture. Uh, you've probably heard of Martin Luther back in uh, the 1400s that nailed on uh, Halloween night his thesis to the door of the church of Wittenberg. And as he nailed that thesis, uh, studying to be a monk, uh, studying to be a priest, God got a hold of his heart to the book of Romans, by the way, and uh, spoke to his heart and said the just shall live by his faith. And he realized that what he was believing was not correct and it was not backed by Scripture. So he came up with his arguments. They were all founded on Scripture, nailed it to the door, and it brought about the Reformation. And the Reformation that spread throughout Germany, we're a product of that today as Baptists. Uh, the Protestant Reformation. We're technically not Protestants as Baptists. We came out of the Protestants. Uh, the Methodists, the Wesleyans, the Episcopalians, all that, they came out of the, the Protestant movement, but we, we even protested. That's what Protestant means is protest, and we protested even that. And we said, well, there's still things we don't agree with. We believe in the scriptural way of baptism by immersion, and a lot of them didn't. They thought you could just sprinkle and it didn't matter. Uh, and we believe in the ordinances of the, of the local church and the, the way we conduct the Lord's Supper. And things like that brought about the Baptist faith. And so it all goes back to the Bible getting the hands of the common people. And I want us to see that tonight as we watch this video presentation on the forbidden book. And it's still a forbidden book. It's forbidden in many countries. I've got outlined in my Bible uh, the number of countries where it is forbidden. You can't bring it into North Korea, for example. You can't bring a copy of the Bible off of you. If you flew to China, you're not allowed to have a copy of the Bible with you when you get off the plane. Uh, if you went to uh, places like Iraq, for example, in uh, Afghanistan and Iran, it's a forbidden book. And it's still a forbidden book, but it's still God's book. Somebody say amen to that. It's God's book. It's not our book. It's His book, and we just trust it and believe it. And I want us to look in His book today, in His Word. Romans chapter number 13, and look in verse number 11. Here's what Paul says here in verse number 11. And that knowing the time, he says that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than we believed. That last part of the verse is where I really want us to, uh, to, to look at this morning, is our salvation is nearer than we believe. 
This morning, all of us, not just senior adults, but uh, all of us today, our salvation, our home going to be with the Lord is nearer today than it was yesterday. It's nearer today than it was the day that we got saved and trusted Jesus as our Savior. And I want us to think today about what Paul says here, our salvation is nearer than we believed. And I want us to think about nearing home. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Lord, as we bow together in prayer, we ask for a special blessing upon the reading of thy holy word. And Lord, I'm reminded often as a Christian and as a preacher and a teacher of thy word, the cost that has been paid, Lord, to get the Bible in the hands of people throughout the centuries. And Lord, we take it for granted every day. We have copies of your word and all around our home and in our vehicles and everywhere we go. And yet so many today just wish that they could have a copy of the Bible for themselves. Many it's banned, many it's forbidden. But I'm thankful, Lord, for those that went before us and gave their life and paved the way that we might have faith in Jesus Christ by believing in the word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And Father, I pray that our faith would be increased in this message today. Lord, use it as you see fit. Use it for your honor and for your glory. I pray your blessing upon it and may you use the message to instruct us, to guide us, to teach us and to lead us to be the Christians you have called us to be today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Romans chapter 13, Paul speaks to believers. These are, uh, this is a church much like here at Mountain Springs Baptist. This is churches, this are, these are believers at Rome and he's writing to the believers at Rome and, and the believers there in the Lord Jesus Christ in trying to get them stirred up in their walk with God. He's trying to get them stirred up, not just physically, but spiritually. For two chapters, Paul, through the Spirit of God, had been trying to beseech God's people to get busy serving God. Now, it's hard for us to imagine that because it was 2,000 years ago, but Paul lived his life in such a way that Jesus, he believed, could come back at any given moment. He encouraged the believers at Rome. He encouraged the believers at Thessalonica. He encouraged the believers at Corinth. You go down the list. He writes to 14 churches in his letters and his epistles. And over and over again, he says, the Lord is returning. Jesus is coming back at any moment. And therefore, we should be busy as the people of God. We should be busy living for God. We should be busy serving God. And Paul used every tactic that he could use to encourage Christians to get busy for God. Sometimes he would try to wake them up. And in fact, in Thessalonica, he said that we're not to sleep as others sleep, but we are to be awake. He used the comparison, the analogy of sleeping, and he said, don't go to sleep spiritually. Be awake, be alert, be active, be sober, he said. Uh, we've got to be busy because the world is in darkness, and we're not of darkness, we're of the day. But we're in a dark world. And he said, so wake up as believers. Get busy as believers. And he tried to stir up the people of God to get busy serving God. What follows is one of the best arguments that he could have possibly made when it comes to getting busy serving God when he says in verse 11, and that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep for our salvation is nearer than we believe. He said, it's time to wake up. It's high time. This is the ultimate time. This is the hour. This is the moment. This is the opportunity to wake out of spiritual slumber, spiritual sleep. Why? Because our salvation is nearer than we believed. What he is saying is this. Our salvation is nearer than we believe. We're nearer to our salvation. Not that our salvation in Jesus Christ will come to pass when we die and we're in the presence of the Lord. We're presently saved. He taught that over and over again, but he's talking about our final home. He's talking about that moment when we finish our race. He's talking about that moment when we cross that line, when we step onto heaven's shore. And he's saying that moment that we get home, our salvation, when we get there, it's nearer than we believe. We're nearing home. Do you realize that we're nearer to heaven today than we were yesterday? Do you realize that we're nearer to heaven today, this Sunday, than we were last Sunday? 
You say, Brother Ben, I got plenty of time. I can do anything I want. Maybe I'll be a senior adult one day, and I'll be recognized one day. We don't know how much time we have. The Bible says, What is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. You're here one moment, you're gone the next. We have no assurity. We have no guarantee of tomorrow. That's why he said, Now is the time. It's today, not tomorrow, but today. Now is the time. Today, if you hear his voice, the Bible says, harden not your hearts. Today's the day. Why? Our salvation is near. Our home going is near. And because it is near, we should live for God. We should be stirred up. We should wake up out of slumber. Paul's saying we're nearing home, so wake up. We're nearing home, so Get out of your sleep and slumbering uh, uh, attitude and mode and be active and be alert and get busy serving God. Get busy living for God. Get busy building your Sunday school class. We don't, have, we don't know how much time we have, so get busy. Get busy winning the lost. We don't know how much time we have, so reach the lost in the time that we have. Get busy growing the church because we don't know how much time we have. We've got to be busy stirring us up, stirring the body of Christ up, reaching the Lost. Get busy. Why? Because we are nearing home. We're getting closer. You know, Paul uses a lot of analogies when he talks about the Christian life, but one of my favorite is Paul uses the Christian life, the analogy of a voyage on a ship, a voyager, a sailor on a ship. And he says conversion, getting saved, is like leaving shore. Do you know our hymn books? are filled with songs about this very thing and this theme. It's, we're, we're on the old ship of Zion in this life, and we're sailing across the troubled waters and the troubled seas, and one day we're going to find that port called heaven, and we're going to pull into that port, and we're going to get off the ship of Zion, and we're going to cross over the Red Sea. We're going to cross over into the promised land. That theme is in a lot of our songs, especially the older hymns. But it's also all through the Bible. And see, conversion, getting saved is like leaving shore and going out to sea. And when the ship is leaving the shore and when it launches out into the deep, that's the time of salvation. And when you and I got saved, we began our voyage into the deep, the time that we got saved. And we'll continue this journey out on the ship of life until we make it to our home. And when I say home, I'm not talking about my home across the street where I live. I'm not talking about your address where you receive your mail. I'm talking about your final home, your ultimate destination, the place where you'll abide with the Lord forever and forever and forever. That is the home Paul's talking about. That's where he's saying we are nearing home heaven's our destination and Paul says once you get saved you begin your journey traveling towards your destination as you get closer to your destination you should feel the urgency you should feel something in your spirit that you know it's getting close I know this morning I'm 43 that's old to some of you and that's young to some of you hey I used to think 43 was ancient 43, I, I thank God every now and then somebody calls me a young man. I don't feel it anymore, but I thank God people and they'll, they'll, they'll say that to me. But uh, to some of you young people, you think 43, that's a dinosaur. And some of y'all think I'm just a whippersnapper. 43 years old. I've had people say, I've got shoes older than you. I've got, uh, you know, things like that. I tell my kids that sometimes. It's the honest truth. I'll say, I've got ties that are older than you are. They get smarter or something. I'll say, I've got a tie in the closet older than you, you know. But you know, as, as we, we live this life, and I think there's something in our spirit, if you're truly saved, there's something in our spirit that's telling us this morning, we're getting closer to home. There's something, I see it uh, in Christians' conversation. I see it even online and people talking, their discussions. And I see it globally around the world where people know there's something in the air. There's something different. There's a change taking place. And as we're saved, the longer we're saved, the closer we get to that destination of heaven, there ought to be something in our spirit. It's an urgency of getting busy for God. There's something deep inside that tells us we're on the ship of life and the ship is getting ready to come into shore. We've got to get urgent. We've got to get busy. We've got to do what God's called us to do. This time that we have is a gift. 
It is a gift and it's here and it's gone. And the time we've got, we've got to accelerate and move forward for God. Why? Because we're going home. We're nearing home. That's what Paul is saying. He's saying we're nearing home. And the older Paul got in his life, the more he talked about heaven and the more he talked about his race being over, just about over and done. And he finished his course. He fought the fight. He kept the faith. He said, it's time for me to get home to a sailor. They say only two places are really worth mentioning, the departure and the arrival. When you leave... And when you get there are the only basic things that are worth any importance to a sailor. And both of these things also imply a third thing. And that's what's in between the departure and the arrival. And that's the trip. That's the journey. And folks, we are in that part right now this morning. We are on the trip. We are in the journey. We are on the voyage. And we're, we're taking the voyage. You're part of it this morning. You're part of the voyage by being at Mount Springs Baptist on this Sunday morning. You're part of it. You've already departed if you're saved. You've already left this world, so to speak, because you've trusted in Jesus Christ. You're awaiting your arrival. You anticipate the arrival. But right now we're in the in-between, the journey. And that's what he's talking about in this passage. Between those two times, the arrival and departure is the journey. I want you to see some things for just a moment about the departure and the arrival. And I want us to think about our life as a journey and our life like a journey on a ship. And as Christians, we are on this voyage. And the beginning of our trip was our conversion, the moment we trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior, the moment we said yes to Jesus Christ. The moment when we became a new creature in Jesus Christ and we began to walk in a different way. The newness of life. We became new in Jesus Christ. The moment we were born again into the family of God, our conversion, that moment through faith, through believing, that's when our departure began. I want us to think about the departure. Paul says in Romans 13, 11, that now... It's high time to wake out of sleep for our salvation is nearer than we believe. He said, we've already departed. And we have believed that's what got us on the journey. It was our belief because that's how we got saved is by belief. Don't let anybody tell you salvation is any other way than by belief in Jesus Christ and what he's done for you. There is no salvation in any other name. There's none other name given among men whereby we must be saved, but in the name of Jesus, the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's our belief in Jesus that saved us. Notice, he said, than when we believed. It's nearer than when we believed. Notice he didn't say, now is our salvation nearer than when we were baptized. He said, than when we believed. You're not saved by your baptism. You're saved by your belief. Notice he didn't say, now is, it, it, not, now is our salvation nearer than when we joined the church. Praise God, join the church. If you're not a member of our church, we want you to join this morning. I hope you do. But he didn't say it's joining the church. He said it's when we believed is when we got saved. He didn't say it's... Now is our salvation nearer than when we put money in the offering plate. He didn't say now is our salvation nearer than when we did a lot of good works and good deeds and we're just a good person. He said it's when we believed our salvation is nearer than when our salvation began when we believed. And this world can make fun of all they want to, terms like born again. You a born again Christian, you better believe I am. You know why? Because Jesus said you must be born again. That ain't a Baptist term. That's a Jesus term. John chapter 3, look it up. That's not made up by Christians in a church to, just to get them on a church roll or get money in a plate or something. That's what Jesus said. You must be born again. That's a Bible word. Born again. The Bible uses terms like saved. Oh, you talk about being saved all the time. Saved, yeah. The Bible talks about being saved. 
And we are saved the moment we believe. The new translations are now rewording it because they believe in progressive salvation. They don't believe in eternal security. They don't believe you can know that you're saved at any moment, even though the Bible says you can know you're saved at any moment. I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. You can know it today. That's the blessed assurance of salvation. But now they'll, they'll reword it. Instead of saying are saved, they'll say being saved. Yes, the Christian life, uh, living for the Lord is a process, but salvation is not. Salvation is instantaneous. Those are biblical terms that describe the new birth. Preaching the gospel of the new birth, listen, will do more for a person or a family or a nation than anything else can do. I, I, I'm all for programs that can help, but listen, I believe preaching the gospel of the new birth will sober a drunk up better than any alcoholic anonymous program could ever do. I believe that the word of God and preaching the gospel from the word of God can bring counseling to a home like no counselor could ever offer them, psychiatrists, psychologists, or anything else. All the problems of this world, I believe, can be found. The answers to the solution can be found by, first of all, trusting in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and being born again. But secondly, by living the life that God's called us to live. We must be born again. And what our nation needs again is to return to scriptural New Testament preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. You must be born again. You must be born again. The born again experience is called the time of our departure. I got saved February the, 18th, uh, February the 10th, 1987. And when I got saved that day, I climbed aboard the old ship Zion. I put my foot on the ship and left the shore of this world behind me. Now I'm on the ship, and the moment I stepped on the ship by faith in Jesus Christ, I'm still seeing the world. I'm still here. But our journey, that, that journey, uh, that voyage has already begun. And I'm now that many years closer to home than I was the day I stepped foot on the ship. I climbed aboard the old gospel ship of Zion back then. My ticket, you say, where'd you get your ticket? It was paid for by the Holy Spirit of God, bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, signed, sealed, and delivered by Jesus Christ. My ticket didn't cost me anything. It was a free gift, and he gave me the gift of salvation, and I took my ticket, and I stepped on board the ship, and I've been sailing towards home ever since. Much in the Bible is given to this experience of the new birth. Somebody says, well, I got saved gradually. No, you don't. You don't get saved gradually. You live for God gradually. You grow as a Christian believer in, in your faith. You, you can grow in, in maturity as a believer. And you go from milk into meat. And you go from spiritual maturity. The longer you're saved, it's God's process of things. But salvation is not gradual. It's instantaneous. You say, I was born saved. Let me tell you something. You were born wrong. You're born lost. The Bible says we are all born in sin. That means that little precious baby, it's hard for our mind to fathom that, but that little precious baby may not be a sinner because it's sinning, but it's a sinner because it's born as a human in a sinful world through sinful actions and takes on the sinful nature that's all found in the New Testament. And it doesn't matter. Every one of us are born wrong. That's why we've got to be born again. If you could be born saved, Jesus wouldn't have told us to be born again. You got saved the moment you believed in Jesus Christ. And Paul said, now is our salvation nearer than we believe. The Bible is filled with verses about our departure and how it's connected with believing. For example, Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. John 1, 12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. John 3, 15, That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him uh, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 16, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. It's present tense. 
And he that believeth not shall not see life, but the wrath of God presently abideth on him. Acts 16, 31, and they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thine house. Believe, 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 believe. That's when our departure started, is when we believed. Our departure. I hope this morning you've already departed on your journey to home. Some of us are closer or further away. Only God knows that. But I hope that you've been saved by believing in Jesus and you've made your departure. But I want us to think, secondly, not only about the departure, but the arrival. The arrival. I want you to notice in Romans 13, 11, he says, but our salvation is nearer than when we believe. We are closer from the, to our arrival than our departure. There is a departure, but there's also an arrival. And Paul said, we're going to arrive home one day. And this thought, listen, it's been heavy on my heart lately. I can't explain it. It's been dear friends and, and, and church members that we've seen that's gone through the valley of the shadow of death and the suffering and so much that we see every day around us and we see the heartache of separation and sorrow and pain and tears and all those things that are there. And you know what it does? It makes us homesick for home. It makes us want to be nearer home. It makes us want to be closer to home. And I'm going to say this morning, the older I get, the longer I live, the, 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 the less this world means to me. There's just something I can't explain. That's not, oh, Brother Ben, you trying to be a holy roller or something. No, I'm not. I'm nothing. I'm nothing. But I'm going to tell you, there's something I think the longer we live as Christians, this world just doesn't have its luster like it once did. The things that meant a lot to me 20 years ago, 30 years ago, just don't mean as much anymore. And in fact, the things that do mean something are connected from the departure to the arrival. And I want one day to see that moment, and I know I'm going to see that moment come to pass, either by death or the coming of Jesus Christ, when I will arrive safely home, and I'll see Jesus face to face. Paul says we're, because of that truth, though, that, that arrival is nearing and getting closer, we are to be busy serving God. Do you know that a lot of the Bible is given to show us how we will arrive home? For example, John 14, we all know that passage where Jesus tells the disciples, he said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If we're not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. You know what Jesus is saying to the disciples in those words? He's preparing them for the arrival. I'm getting something prepared for you. I'm building a mansion for you. I'm going to bring you to where I am. You're going to be there. That's the arrival. Why should you and I as Christians serve God, though? Because we should serve Him because one day we're going to arrive. One day we're going home. One day we're going to see Jesus. If that could ever get in our minds this morning, we're going to see Him. We're going to behold him. We're going to be confronted by him. We're going to give an account of our life. Why should we live a godly, separated life in this world? Not to be holier than other people, but to bring honor to God. Because one day we're going to see him. Why should we read our Bible daily? Because we're going to arrive one day. We're going to see him. Why should we spend time in prayer? Because one day we're going to see him and arrive on heaven's shore. Why should we come to church? Because one day we're going to give an account of our journey. We're going to stand before the Lord at our arrival. Why should we stand up for what's right in a world that stands for what's wrong? Because one day we're going to arrive. We've already departed. But we're going to arrive, and when we arrive, what's going to count is what we did after our departure. We're going home. We're nearing home. Paul said, I want you as believers to wake up and I want you to see that we are nearer than when our, we first believed. We are closer to home than when we first believed. And because of that, we've departed and we're going to arrive. But here's where I want to close with is the journey. You see, the journey is important. The departure, our salvation is talked about all through the Bible. In fact, much of the Bible tells us about the arrival 
and about the departure and the arrival of getting to heaven. And to me, salvation is more important than the journey, yet going to heaven is just as important, if not more so. In the Bible, there's more said about our journey than there is even about heaven or our salvation. It's about our time down here. You say, why? Because God uses the Bible and uses the time we have down here. And I don't know how long that's going to be. I don't know. You don't know. But he uses this time down here to prepare us for the arrival. We already departed. But this Christian life is to make us appreciate the arrival. Now, here's a tough way of looking at things, and I'm not saying I can look at it that way all the time, but I still know what's right. All those verses we read about in Revelation, there'll be no more tears, there'll be no more sorrow, there'll be no more death, and all those things. What would heaven mean to us if we didn't have any of those things? You see, the tears that we don't enjoy down here is what's going to make the arrival that much more special because there's no tears there. And the pain down here that we endured is going to make the arrival that much more special because it's a place where there is no more pain. And the sorrow down here is going to make it that much more special because when we arrive, it's a land where there's no more sorrow. You see what I'm saying? You ever notice how you never appreciate your health till you lose it? You ever have a bad migraine? Amen, Brother Ben, I have. And you think, oh my goodness, I, I took for granted all the days I didn't have a migraine. Boy, then you appreciate the days you don't have them. But you never appreciated the days unless you had the migraine. You ever get cold or flu or something? Some of y'all may have had COVID or something. You, and you think, oh God, I, I remember what it was like when I was healthy and well and felt great. And when you don't feel great, you appreciate when you did feel great. Heaven, the arrival, is going to feel great and be wonderful because of the journey down here. The suffering, the trials, the tears, the heartache is going to make the arrival that much more special. But we still have the journey here. Now think about it like this. We're getting ready to part. That's our salvation. Back behind us is our old life. We believe it. We're leaving this behind. Somewhere out there, we don't know when, the day or the hour, but there's our destination. That's our arrival. And every traveler has one of two choices this morning to make. You can either look backwards to the life you left behind and backwards to the old world and backwards behind you, or you can look ahead in your journey to your arrival. It's up to us. We can look backwards and spend all of our Christian time traveling towards our arrival facing the world. Or we can make our journey to our arrival, heaven, leaving the world behind us. You know what most Christians' problems are? I'm just going to be honest with you. Is we spend all of our time traveling towards our arrival facing the world. We're moving backwards. I'll never forget, Aluna, bless her heart, she came to the United States... We took her up to uh, Kings Island up in Ohio, around Cincinnati. It's kind of like uh, Carowinds. And never been on a roller coaster in her life. She's never forgiven me for this. Uh, and uh, we weren't married at the time, I don't think. It's a wonder she didn't call off the engagement then. Because my brother and I, we said, we're going we're gonna to put her on a roller coaster. And they have what's called a red and blue racer. I don't know if you've ever seen this before. The red and blue racer is a side-by-side -side roller coaster. That's back in the days when I was younger that I liked that kind of stuff. You can have it. I don't care to ever get on another one again. And uh, just driving in traffic in Monroe has enough to try my patience. <laughs> and enough to give me a panic attack that having to worry about being on a roller coaster doing anything and so Aluna never been on there and we thought it'd be funny to put her on a roller coaster and we put on we got on the one that goes backwards now imagine you've never been on a roller coaster and you sit in one and all of a sudden you're going backwards it was not a great rest of the day I'll just put it that way and we've never forgot that experience but a lot of Christians, you know what we do? We get saved. I want to go to heaven. I'm trusting Jesus Christ to save me. God saves me. I put my faith and believe in him. We say, okay, I'm going to get there one day. 
and we face the world the rest of our time, we're like on a roller coaster going backwards towards heaven. Why in the world, after we have departed, do we want what's behind us? Why do we want to look like that? Why do we want to act like that? Why do we want to uh, dress like that? Why do we want to talk like that? Why do we want to behave like that? When that's not our arrival, that's our departure. We want to look like what's before us. We want to talk like what's before us. I don't want to know what the world looks and talks like. I want to know what heaven's like. I want to live like them. That's the journey. Lot's wife is the only person Jesus said to remember in the New Testament. You think about that. He referred to many people in the New Testament, in the Gospels, but the only person he said to remember was Lot's wife. That was her problem. God had miraculously delivered her. That was her departure. She left Sodom. I mean, and God did it through a supernatural means, but guess what? God saved you through a supernatural means. You're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And God told to the angels, he said, don't look back, look forward. And she made her way outside of Sodom and just had to do this and had to see what she was leaving behind. And it cost her her life. And Jesus said, remember her? Remember her? Don't forget her. She looked back. You hear me talk about it all the time, but that was Israel in the wilderness. Israel did that constantly. Constantly, they're saying, for 400 years, they said, deliver us, deliver us. We're in Egypt. Egypt's a type of the world. Pharaoh's a type of the Antichrist. They're praying for a deliverer. The Jews are in, in Egypt. They're in the world. They're being persecuted. It's a picture of what's coming ahead for the nation of Israel when the Antichrist is going to persecute them again. That's why Revelation is full of plagues. Everything that happened before is going to happen in the future. It's going to be a full circle. And they're crying out to God, deliver us, deliver us. We're in the world. And God sends a deliverer, Moses. And Moses himself says he's a type of the coming true deliverer, Jesus Christ. A prophet shall uh, uh, rise up like unto me prophetically talking about Jesus. God delivers them out of Egypt. And as soon as they step foot out of Egypt, they say, wait, wait, wait. Oh, I remember the cucumbers and the leeks and the garlic and the onions and the melons. And all we have out here is this manna. That's us and Christians in this world. God saves us from the world. Gives us his word, and we say, God, that ain't good enough. I don't need you. I don't need that. Honey, oh, but look, it's an award show. Oh, look, it's the latest movies. And it's, oh, have you seen the view? Oh, but it's 50 shades of gray. And oh, it's, it's all. Why do we want to live like that? That's our departure. That's our arrival. How's your journey this morning? How's your journey? The Bible tells us that we are to set our affections on things above, not on things beneath. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. I know the world has a lot of beauty, but our affections should be on heavenly things. Lay up not for yourself treasures on earth, but treasures in heaven. You know, when we flew, we've flown overseas quite a few times, and I was thinking as I was studying this message about when we traveled to Malaysia, I think Jared's been to Malaysia before. There's, has anybody else been to Malaysia in here? Uh, but Malaysia, it's an experience. It's a long flight. I think it was like 26 hours in the air or something like that. It, it's a long, long, long flight. I think we stopped in Taiwan or something like that on the way. But it's interesting. As you get on board the flight going to Malaysia, everything on the flight is designed to look like what you're going to be experiencing in Malaysia. I mean, all the, uh, um, uh, the flight attendants are dressed in, in cultural attire. The food, and I, I'll try all kinds of food. Luna tell you, we love all kinds of food. Uh, and, but uh, the, some of the food, I mean, it took a, we had to pray and bless it. I'll put it that way. On top of it, it's airplane food. You always need to bless airplane food, amen? Um, any of y'all travel know what I'm talking about. It's, it's a close cousin to school lunches, young people. I remember I told my dad when I was a kid about 10 years old, I said, the hot dogs at school, I'm not going to eat it. They're made out of rubber. He said, Ben, they're not made out of rubber. I said, yes, they are. And every time they'd have hot dogs at school, I'd say, they're made out of rubber. 
He wouldn't believe me. So one day I brought one home and I said, Dad, look at this. And I took the hot dog and threw it on the ground. It bounced about four bounces before it landed. <laughs> and he finally believed me after that. But the food, everything is, you know why? Because it's anticipating on the journey where you're arriving to. And it's trying to make the journey resemble your destination. But when you're coming back from Malaysia to the United States, it's all gone. And now, whatever American culture is, is about nothing. Now it's back to American food on the plane. The, wait, uh, the, the stewardess, everybody on board, this looks like typical Americans. Why? Because we're going back to where we had left before. And that's what Paul is trying to give us an example in the Christian life. We ought to live not reflecting the life we left behind, but the life we're getting ready to enjoy. Because that is our arrival. The old song says, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And the reason we don't get to heaven the moment we got saved, oh, that would have been awesome. The moment we got saved, God just raptures us all up to heaven. But he lets us live down here to prepare us for our arrival. That means if I got saved in February 1987, I'm 34 years closer to my arrival than I am from my departure. I don't know what your spiritual birth date is today. And it's not all based on age. I'm not just talking to our seniors today. You might feel like you're closer home because of age, but it could happen to any of us. We could go out of this world in a moment's notice, no matter how young or old. But because of that fact, we ought to do everything we can to keep our eye on our arrival while we're in the journey after we've departed when we are saved. Jesus said in John 14, 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my Father. Think about these passages. Jesus is preparing the disciples for what's coming at their arrival. Romans 12, 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be a transformed by the renewing of your mind. We ought to think different than our departure. By the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Philippians 2, 5, 5 Let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus. We're not to have the mind like we used to have. We have a renewed mind and it's to be a mind like Jesus Christ. Philippians 3, 20 For our conversation is in heaven. Notice it's present tense already as if we're there. Your, my, our conversation is in heaven. Our conversation be heavenly conversation. For whence also we look for, uh, for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 4, 17. Here is, herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. We have departed. We are making our journey. But we're going to arrive one day by faith in Jesus Christ. Nobody gets on board a cruise ship or a boat and says, wait a minute, I want the boat pulled out of the water. I don't trust it. I got to expect it. I've got to check. I want all this. Uh, I want the facts and figures, measurements. I want inspection. You just climb on board and trust it. Kind of like a picture of our faith. Jesus, I don't understand it all, but I'm trusting you. That's our salvation, our belief. That's when we depart. And if the ship sinks, we're going down with it. If it stays afloat, we're going with it. Why? Because Jesus is our ship. And thank God we're on the old ship as I am. So what God is saying this morning, he's saying that we ought to keep our eyes on our arrival because we're in a journey. And it won't be long. We are going home. We are closer to home than we've ever been before. Let me ask you to bow your head in prayer today. For just a moment, as we'll get a song of invitation here in just a second. But think about this message, kind of a very simple message today.